Good afternoon. My name is Brian Luck. I'm an assistant professor and extension specialist in biological systems engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, welcome to Crop Scouting School 21, somewhere in there for uh, the Iowa State uh, IPM MPM group. I was uh, I was tapped to have a conversation with you about cool tools uh, for and technology for crop scouting. So when I start any technology discussion or talk, I, I like to give a little background and just get you thinking a little bit. Um, so the first thing we'll cover is, have you given any thought to um, how far we've come in terms of technology in the last hundred years? So looking at you know the, the upper left picture kind of progressing from upper left to lower right, um, you know, we, we started out horse, horse drawn machines, moldboard plows, et cetera, even earlier than that. Um, but, but sometime in the 1920s, we were still using those, um, invention of the tractor. Obviously I'm a machinery systems guy, um, and, and precision ag specialist. So my brain always tips to tractors and, and farm machines. Um, I have to put the Alice Chalmers D21 in there just cause it's my favorite and easy to support. Nobody gets mad at me because the company's out of business. Um, and then finally, you know, that, that lower right picture is something on the internet could be photoshopped. We could debate that, but, you know, really we've come from horse drawn to multiple, multiple 700 plus horsepower machines in the field, um, to, to do our agricultural production. So just a little seed for thought there a bit to, to think about, you know, in a hundred years, hundred years isn't that long. You know, human beings can live to be a hundred years old. So we've, we've made a big leaps and bounds in terms of technology. The other point I'd like you to think about too is um, some of the computing power available to us. So I'm gonna walk you through, you know, I, I somebody mentioned this to me at one point, but um, if you look at the Apollo trip to the moon, the Apollo guidance computer, um, I have some, some data on what that had. So we're talking about 64 kilobytes of memory, which is the random access memory I'm talking about there, RAM. Um, and the processor associated with that computer was 0 0.043 megahertz. So think about your desktop computer, think about your laptop, or even better, think about these bricks that we all carry in our pockets nowadays. So I have since updated my phone I don't have a Galaxy S7 anymore, um, but I did previous to my current phone, but that device has four gigabytes of random access memory and four processors all running in the gigahertz range, one and two gigahertz range. Um, so it's about two, more than two million times faster uh, than the computer they use to, to put man on the moon. So we've got a lot of opportunity here in agriculture when we talk about these different devices that we have access to and other, other things that we have access to that were never available to us in the past. And even some of that applies to what we're talking about today in some of this crop scouting. So my funny picture also, you know, is, is when you get in a tractor cab, it's usually used to be steering wheel, throttle, clutch brake, gear shift lever, and a few hydraulic levers. Now we've got screens, monitors, buttons, um, everything, everything in the cab and, and all kinds of data associated that we're collecting with the, with the machines, uh, data about the crops, sensors, et cetera. So we're going to get into some more details on this today. Um, but there's my sort of my introduction um, to, to wh where we've come, at least in, in agriculture over the, over the last hundred years. So getting into some crop scouting stuff. So I will openly admit right off the bat that I am not a crop scout. Um, I'm, I'm basically with it. I got tabbed for the technology expert here and, and that's a good thing. But what I did is I wanted to touch base for you just with a couple of my good friends that are crop consultants and, and crop scouts. And, and one of those is Eric Birschbach here in Southern Wisconsin. Um, he runs Ag Site Crop Consulting LLC. One of my good friends, independent crop consultant here. Um, and I, I did ask him, I said, just, you know, from my standpoint, walk me through what you do when you go to a field, you know, and, and I'm assuming other presenters in this series will probably cover this, so I won't spend a ton of time on it here today. Um, but basically, from his standpoint, 
when he drives up to the field, he wants to know what is the current crop, obviously. Um, and also what was the previous crop? Because uh, some of the things that can happen that you're diagnosing in the field can be caused due to the previous crop that came before. Um, and he said, first off the bat is do an overview of the field as best you can. In some cases, it's hard to get a look at the entire field from the road, but he said, Identi identify any good or bad locations. What would you, what you would consider as good or bad? Um, he said, uniformity is a big key. So you seeing uniformity or lack thereof in the field uh, should point you to an area uh, that you probably need to visit and do some investigating about what's going on. And he said, then go back and forth. He's like, when you find a good, what you would consider a good or a bad location, you go back between those multiple times, go to the good location, go to the bad, investigate, look at leaves, look at soil, look at all the different things you're doing and try to discern what's different in those cases. Um, the joke we tell up here in Wisconsin is, you know, rather than see the whole field, the folks in Wisconsin walk a W through the field and the folks in Minnesota walk an M and they both find totally different things when they went through that field. So finding the good and bad locations and diagnosing what's going on between those uh, is, is a good place to start. And, and he, the last bullet point there is, is I think the most, uh, the most telling about Eric, he said, most importantly, bring your curiosity. Um, he said, every time you see something, that question should pop in your mind. What in the heck is going on here? And we try to figure out and diagnose those. So if we have an opportunity to correct issues, um, we can. So after talking to Eric, I had, a, I had a little bit more conversation with him and a few other folks about what are some of the tools that we use. And uh, before we get into the technology and what I'll call later the fun stuff in my mind, that's what I do for a living. So I think it's the fun stuff. Let's talk about some of the basics. Um, and, and I give this speech, part of this speech, to my undergrads that work for me, anybody that's graduating from undergrad or graduate school. There's a couple of life lessons here that you can learn, maybe put to use now, um, that will make you a better crop consultant, employee in general, et cetera. So and it's really just this first one that I'm fixing to show you. And that one would be pencil and paper. Um, and I know I'm dating myself a bit here by saying that I love to use pencil and paper. I carry a notebook. I put the one I I prefer, uh, the three by five right in the rain. If that's above your budget, then there's other just pencil and paper notebook. Use a composition notebook. Um, they're 50 cents at most grocery stores. Um, one of the things you'll learn as you move, move on in life with these internships um, and school I'm sure you're doing the same thing in, with your classes. Um, and then when you get out in a job is, is writing things down is key. Now, how you choose to do that's up to you. Um, I'm going to talk about digital note taking a little bit later. Um, but if you do have pen and paper, that's basically foolproof. So there are places in Wisconsin that I have been um, that I needed internet access to do something on my phone. Uh, and don't have it, right? So if your app or your note-taking app or whatever requires connectivity, uh, it won't let you do it. Or if it does let you do it, it won't save it and then it's lost forever, right? So having uh, having pencil and paper in pocket, pen and paper, whatever you choose, um, is a wonderful, wonderful tool to have in, have in your arsenal. There's a couple of other things I'll say about it. And, and the list there, I won't read it to you. You can put, you know, whatever you want to in your in your pencil and paper in your notebook. Two things is one, a lot of people don't think about this, but if you do keep track of page numbers, uh, as you go through that, you can leave a couple of pages in the front of the notebook uh, to write an index. So if it's important and you need to refer back to it, you are able to put a topic and a page number um, in the front two, three pages, and then that's a quick scan to be able to turn right to it. That's a life hack, I guess we'll call it. Um, the other thing is that last bullet point under pencil and paper is writing it down is not enough. Um, you have to get in a habit with this and same thing on digital note taking, et cetera, uh, reviewing what you wrote down. So if it's from a crop can, crop scouting standpoint, you know, I found this, that, or the other thing, or I counted this many uh, plants as far as emergence goes in these areas, um, just because you wrote it down doesn't mean it's it's useful information. You have to come back to it, review, and uh, and do something with it. 
So get off my soapbox a little bit on, on pen and paper, but it's a cheap solution uh, and 99.9% .9 of the time it works uh, compared to some of our digital technologies. Um, don't let your pen run out of ink, I guess is what I'm saying. So some other things that Eric, Eric brought up with me and a few others um, that he carries to the field with him and, and tools, I would call them tools. Um, he said, bring a spade or a digging tool of some sort. I happen to find one here that's uh, foldable and packable and lightweight and has a bottle opener and a saw and all kinds of good stuff. Doesn't have to be that fancy. Um, can just be a, a garden trowel, whatever. He said, there's a lot of things you can do looking in the soil, dig it down a few inches. Um, you can learn a lot from what's going on in the soil by looking at it uh, when you're crop scouting. And he said, the other thing is insect photos, which I didn't think about this. Um, but he said, <laughs> I put on there, ew, I don't want to touch it. Or maybe I didn't realize those stung or bit. Um, but if there is an insect that you want to ID and you want to get a photo of it, picking it up with a, with a trowel or a shovel may be a little safer sometimes um, if you're worried about that. So just a few things, a few things the spade or digging tool could be used for. Next thing is there's a lot of population counting that goes on in crop scouting. So that's one thing that he wanted me to, me to you know, kind of touch on is what you need for population counting. Um, you know, there, we, in our lab, we use PVC, um, what we call sticks that we've measured out and they're kind of packable down to about four feet. And then we can pin them out to that 17 and a half feet or 17.5 feet um, to measure our 30 inch rows um, populations. If you're on 15 inch rows, just remember to measure twice, uh, measure two lengths of that 17 and a half feet. Um, there's also apps for that. So it's something you can pay attention to as well. I know we have a, a soybean app here in Wisconsin called Bean Cam. Uh, it's out of Dr. Conley's lab. And you're able to use that to, it, it helps you make a replant decision. Um, but also I believe it gets pretty close on counting emergence with uh, planted and drilled beans. If you are doing drilled stuff, um, I, something I found too is use a hula hoop. And, and Eric brought this up. He carries one with him as well. Um, I did find, you know, since I'm doing this for Iowa State, the, the extension pub on stand assessment. And, and I'll put the link there in the, in the presentation. Easy to find on the website. And it gives you a, a good walkthrough on how to, uh, how to count emergence with a hula hoop and what kind of math is involved to, to get to a final, final number there. Okay. Finally, um, the final tools I'll get into is, is sweep net. Um, this is, I bring this up because I am in Wisconsin and we grow a lot of alfalfa for our dairy farms. Um, but if you do, are you do, if you are doing an insect assessment uh, and you're involved with it, sweep nets are, are priceless to be able to see, kind of catch what's there if you get into the things you can't see. Um, Eric recommended also bringing two in case one gets wet if you do sweep net in the morning. Um, you can have a dry one in the afternoon and let the other one dry as you go. Uh, typical field work stuff, sunblock, long pants, wide brim hat, put a picture of me and my goofy hat down there for you to look at. Um, I'm a ginger, so I'm all about sunblock and long sleeve t-shirts. And in some cases you might want some gloves as well. So a few things to think about there. Finally, um, one tool that, that my plant pathology friends kind of brought up that I didn't think about is having a, a jeweler's loop. And these are really all they are, just little magnifying glasses, pocket size. You can put them in your pocket and carry them out. Um, but as far as a tool goes, you know, if you're looking at, let's say, tar spot and corn or something like that, and there's maybe one distinct, um, distinct facet that you need to see to determine whether it's one disease from another, um, based on the center of the dot on the leaf, uh, a bit of magnification never hurts, right? To be able to to see that well, so. Again, less than $10 on Amazon, you can have one of these and it's got a light in it and all kinds of fancy stuff. But it's just not a bad idea to have some of those, at least some of those tools, or at least ask the, uh, the company you're going with as far as your internship, what they provide and what you think you might need um, to bring yourself. So, so with that, um, you know, we can get into some of these conversations of technology. Um, so beyond basic tools, some technologies can help data collect data, and, and we all realize that. And generally what I'm going to talk about here is just a couple. I, I don't want to go, there's a there's a bunch of apps out there that are for crop scouting. And, um, you know, we can go as simply as, you know, quite literally Microsoft um, OneNote or some of the online note-taking apps um, to do this as well. But 
I did want to draw your attention to something. I didn't see any point in reinventing the wheel. My good friend Brian Arnall down at uh, Oklahoma State a few years ago uh, did for our Info Ag conference a review of crop scouting out crop scouting apps. Uh, that was in 2017. So this information is a little dated, except the apps are still out there and generally uh, do the same thing. But what he did was he went through and, and got his hands on 17 of them, um, either via 30 day free trials or, um, you know, contacting the company and can I get an evaluation license for so many days, et cetera. Um, he categorized them into several different categories. Um, looking for large, you know, apps that were associated for large groups or just individuals maintaining the data um, as you go out in the field. He did assess them for drawing field boundary, field boundaries, entering crop or field information, weather data usage. So whether they incorporated weather data into their uh, into their logging platform, data collection, also information sharing and overall functionality. Of, and in his opinion. Um, and then another thing that he assessed, and this kind of jumped out at me because I'm a precision ag guy anyway, um, is the ability to build management zones straight from the app and, and share that by a shape file um, to the machines that are applying either fertilizer, seeding rate, et cetera. Um, so anyway, he, he didn't necessarily do a full blown, you know, week upon week use of each app, but he did go in and just, you know, tried to assess them how they were using, how they were the overall functionality and usability. The other thing he did um, as well is, is he did not rate them. He did not put a one through 10 or anything like that on it. Um, but I would recommend you go to his blog and take a look at the, the webpage if you're thinking about getting hold of some of these. Um, and some of the recommendations too on there that I didn't put on this slide were, were, you know, do the training. There's always a training associated with the apps. They have a little, here's how to do this, that, and the other thing. He said, that's the first thing he would do. Um, and the other thing you got to consider is what, when you go work for a company in these internships, what app are they using and will you have access to it or be able to be able to get your hands on it. Okay. So we'll just go through a couple of them here. I, I didn't want to spend too much time on this. Um, but the couple that jumped out at me, um, again, like I said, I'll go through a few, but read the full review from Dr. Alnal, but pro Agrica Cirrus is one, um, that, that looked pretty powerful, um, has a PC web-based version, uh, as well as you can get it on your mobile device, on your phone, tablet, et cetera. Um, you can scout with locations and photos, so drop pins where you found things uh, in the field. You can generate recommendations straight from the field. You don't have to be on the web app or download any software to do that. Also generate PDF reports, so it's pretty easy for anybody to get, uh, to get access to read them. And the other thing I thought was really interesting is, is two things here but it sets up grid or zone soil sampling based on your input. So you spend the time in the app to say, you know, either by soil type or slope or, you know, there's a million different variables we can put into our grid or soil zone sampling, um, grid or zone soil sampling, excuse me, um, setups that allow you to do that. And the other thing I think is really neat is it, it does uh, connect to Raven Slingshot. So if people are using that controller on their application machines, um, you can send recommendations and prescriptions uh, straight to the slingshot from the app. The other one I'll talk about too, just again, because I'm speaking to folks from Iowa is, is the Scout Pro. Um, so data provided and some of the information for this one is, is in collaboration with Iowa State and Kansas State Universities. Um, but this one kind of jumped out at me as well before I even knew that because it's got the pest ID. Um, built into it. So they have a, a library of weeds, insects, you know, different things, um, diseases, I'm sure, in there that if you see something and you don't know what it is, you can scroll through and say, okay, that looks closest to this, that, or the other thing um, and make an identification without having to contact your extension professional um, sometimes. So anyway, it crop scouting reports easily shareable and it's got a id for pests and it still does a lot of locations and and um note taking documentation uh that some of the other apps do as well okay so those are the two i wanted to cover um please go look at the rest of them there's there's more than 17 out there now um and and you can make your own decision there's free versions and like i said the other thing that you should consider as well is basically there there's a you can sort of build your own. 
you know, if you're thinking about using one note or something along those lines, you know, you can, you can take notes digitally that way as well and, and figure out how to grab a GPS location and put it in there. There's, there's ways around that. So um, again, the take home messages here are pretty brief other than the fact that apps exist and, and I can't even begin to cover how many there are and how to use them. Uh, but the company you're working for may have a specific one you need to use. Um, do the training in app or get on YouTube, Google, et cetera, and find a way to get up to speed on how to use it quickly. Um, if they have, uh, in the engineering world, we talk about um, version control for design purposes. Same thing here. You want to make sure you're you're maintaining the, the format that the company requires for submitting these reports as well. Um, Aside from that, take good notes, photos, and pics uh, for the generated report. Again, any shortcomings of the app, if it doesn't have a feature that you need, generally can be compensated with pen and paper and a little data processing on the back end. But finally, I would recommend going and reading Dr. Onall's post for, um, for more information on apps and things like that. <clears throat> I'll also provide a, a shameless plug for the uh, University of Wisconsin Badger Ag Tech Lab, which is my lab. We have an app as well. So if you get into any dairy work uh, during corn silage harvest, we have an app called Silage Snap. And you can take a picture of, uh, of corn silage, the corn, crack kernels contained within the corn silage and get an idea how well your kernel processor is doing. So there's my one, one slide of a shameless plug for this presentation. So take a look. So from my standpoint, now for the fun stuff. Okay, so we're going to talk about, I wrote here, unmanned aerial vehicles, but the real um, proper terminology is uncrewed aerial vehicles uh, and how we use these for crop scouting and also for data collection. So I got a little interesting study I'm going to share with you here at the end that we're doing in my lab that, uh, that can show you some, maybe show you some of the benefits of using these tools. And then I can't help but put a good corn time um, cartoon in, in the head of my presentation, especially when it's about drone hunting. So first things I'll talk to you about, and, and this is some a message that I'm still having to spread, um, is the rules and regulations for flying UAVs. So I'm, I'm a little leery of knowing how many ag companies have UAVs and how many people aren't licensed to fly them through the FAA. But that said, there is a remote pilot license uh, that is required about $150 um, and is good for two years when you need $150 to take the test uh, and it's good for two years. There's a few rules that we have to pay attention to. So visual line of sight must be maintained between the operator and the aircraft. Um, currently, first person view goggles do not meet the see and avoid requirements. So when I say see and avoid is if I have my UAV in the air and I see an airplane, I get my UAV out of the way. Um, still at a 400 feet max altitude. Um, I wouldn't recommend flying any higher than that. I can barely see it anymore and I'm farsighted at 400 feet. Uh, daylight operation only, unless you have an exemption from the FAA, which are not that hard to get a lot of times. Um, max speed of 100 miles per hour, which is way too fast to be flying anyway. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, and then there's a reporting requirement on any incident. So report to the FAA within 10 days of any operation that results in at least seriously, serious injury, loss of consciousness, or property damage of at least $500. So 500 or more. Um, the one question I always have is that loss of consciousness is there, and I don't know who they mean. Is that the pilot loses consciousness or the person the UAV hit loses consciousness? So um, that's up for interpretation. There is an FAA Part 107 compliance policy that I don't believe a lot of people are aware of. Um, and usually it's going to include warnings, education, et cetera, if something happens um, bad. But they do cite that they can fine individuals up to $11,000 per incident. That's something I think most people aren't aware of. So, um, you know, it's, it's not a hard test to take just to make sure you understand the rules of the road or the rules of the air in this case. Um, and it will sort of alleviate you from some liability, especially if you don't, uh, if you aren't licensed and are flying these machines. So just for that, I spent a little time there. I'll tell you, um, we hosted a, a short course training in Wisconsin a couple of years ago, and we're looking to do that again, hopefully. Um, 
and this is something that you're welcome to get in touch with me if you're interested, you know, very small fee um, to attend the class pretty much covers your lunch and our mileage to get to wherever we're going. But I was pretty close. So if you want to want to do that, we can do it. Um, and then other training opportunities. I'm sure this joke works better in person, but you know, I'd rather you take my training. So we'll leave it at that. Um, something I did want to show you though, is this is University of Dayton Research Institute. And I grabbed this from Popular Mechanics, but it's just a, a phantom, DJI phantom interacting at flight speeds uh, with an airplane wing. Make sure the video plays here, but it looks like it will. Um, so if you're wondering why all the rules and regs you know, there, there's it. If, if you did that to an airplane wing in flight, that, that airplane's not going to have a good time getting on the ground. Um, if it does even get on the ground or just come straight down. Um, so anyway, long story short, these things are really cool, great tool for agriculture. And we're fixing to talk about why, um, but being licensed and covering yourself on that liability is a big, big uh, plus. So if it's not you, you might ask some questions around your, uh, your companies that you go to work for in the internships. Okay. So I got a, a neat picture here from uh, from Central Wisconsin, and this is one just quick UAV up, take a picture, straight back down. And I always spend way too much time on this, so I'm going to be mindful of of how many how many minutes I spend on this slide. But there are a few things that I want to point out within the image, um, and then we can have a debate at some point when we're able to get back together on um, whether you would have seen this from the road or not. So. First of all, I want you to pay attention to the edge of the field. I believe I have a marker here. So looking, you know, sort of across this edge and all the way down the field, um, you're able to see immediately that the outside pass of corn rows is lighter color than the internal rows of the field. Could be a lot of things, right? Could be water, could be a lot of things. My guess is a nitrogen deficiency in that area. I don't know if the application rig didn't get out that far um, or something happened, but there's there's eight to 12 rows there that, uh, that didn't get enough nitrogen. A few other things in the field that are interesting and probably the fault of uh, precision agriculture, but if you look, you know, you got just blank spots that appear to be an exact planter width. Um, some more back here that might be a different something's different about them. Um, you know, it could be any number of things, could be a reload of the planter where they stopped and took off again, everything's got momentum. So maybe a spot got skipped. Um, what is going on here is this is a replant section. Um, so the maturity, not maturity, but the age, the, the growth stage of the corn is different in those squares than around the surrounding um, plants. Uh, but it's still an area where the, where the machine stopped planting. Um, there's some other things you can kind of pick up looking at uh, areas around the waterways. Uh, maybe the, the boundaries for those are set up not so well. Um, and maybe there's corn in there that isn't getting the nitrogen applied, or we could just be looking at grass in the waterway there as well. I can't, there's not enough detail there to actually see what's going on. Finally, the last thing I'll sort of point out is you can see the tracks through the field, but you do see these diagonal lines um, going through in several spots through there. And the one thing that my, my major professor and my master's degree always told me was, is that nature doesn't do anything straight. If anything's, you know, involved with a natural occurrence, it's either got a bend or a curve or something in it. Anything you find in a field that's generally a straight line is gonna be man-made and caused by some of the things we're doing in the field. Um, I couldn't really tell you what that is. My guess is, is they till that field on a diagonal um, and it might be the result of some different soil types or hard pan generated from the tillage or, you know, could be tire compaction. I'm not sure the dimensions there. Um, but anyway, long story short, you can see all of this from the field, one single picture. Um, and if you get a little higher resolution, say not be at 400 feet like we are here, um, and, and get down a little closer, you know, I, I believe, and I've had actually had crop consultants tell me this, is they make decisions on where to go first in the field based on this image. So put the UAV up for five minutes, take two or three good pictures and bring it down, take a look on their iPad and the truck, 
that's where they're going to go first. They'll identify the areas to, to go check first and see what's going on. Okay. So aside from visible light, which pretty pictures are great. And I love talking about this one because it is, it is a good looking picture, honestly. Um, there's another thing called remote sensing. And I'll spend just a minute on this with you. And then I believe I'm running out of time. So um, what is remote sensing? And, and visible light imagery is, is a form of remote sensing, but it's truly measurement or analysis of a phenomenon without being direct, indirect contact with it. Um, it relies on measure, measurement of electromagnetic magnetic energy. So, you know, could be visible light, could be in different, uh, different spectra than we're able to see. Um, but we measure either reflectance, transmittance, absorbance, things along those lines. Most common, common one you hear about these days uh, is the normalized difference vegetative index or NDVI. That's, it's just math magic looking at the different, uh, different wavelengths reflected from plants. I'll get into that in a second. I won't spend too much time, but basically it, it identifies a list of things here and I put them on the screen. I'll read a few nutrient deficiencies, disease, water deficiency, or surplus. Um, Long and the short of it is, it's identifying how green that plant is, and it defines it well. Um, and then areas of the plant that are less green, or areas of the field that are less green, are experiencing some sort of stress. Um, there's other vegetative index indices out there uh, that you're welcome to go investigate and see. You know, if if a certain sensor is able to measure those, but the most common is in DVI right now. So the whole um, magnetic electromagnetic spectrum on a bar at the top. And then the part we can see is, is magnified there. Um, so, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the remote sensing things are, are going in that visible light uh, and near infrared. So, you know, the 800, 900 thousand nanometers uh, beyond red. Then when we get into infrared what we are measuring is technically temperature. So we're able to measure um, the, the actual temperature of an object without, uh, without touching it. And then you get down into the ultraviolet range. There's a lot of research going on now um, looking into what ultraviolet, you know, sort of reflectance, absorbance, et cetera, uh, means for plants as well. So, and then, you know, we're, we're talking about multispectral sensors is the terminology I'll use. There's also hyperspectral sensors um, that go through the infrared nearly through the infrared range as well. So they'll start, start in ultraviolet and go beyond uh, infrared. And, and there's a lot of math magic goes behind um, interpreting that data as well. So that's where the research area is happening now. I'll just give you quick, you know, NDVI is, is nothing more than a, a ratio of several different wavelengths, uh, NIR and vi minus visible light over NIR plus visible light. So it, it's nothing to, too complicated as far as the math um, ranges from negative one to one. Usually you'll have less than 0.1 is, you know, soil, rock, sand, snow, et cetera. Uh, and then 0.6 to 0.9 is, is dense vegetation. I tell you all that just to, to get into what we're doing in our lab a little bit and show you some of the sensors that we have. So um, we're using a DJI Matrice, uh, which is a 100. It's kind of a, an older model now. Um, but a very nice platform to carry it. We also have Phantoms. We have the big S1000. We have Matrice 600s. There's there's a lot of them. Um, we have a Microsense, Microsense Red Edge multispectral camera. And then what's covered up there is we're using a Zenmuse XT thermal camera as well uh, to measure some of these things. I think this is a video just to give you an idea. Um, got a little audio with it as well. Uh, just shows you how that machine takes off 100% autopilot. So we're able to plan our uh, flight paths and altitude and everything and basically hit the go button. Uh, it takes off successfully, flies back and forth uh, and then comes back home. Generally, we choose to land it manually um, because it does not have any of the fancy sensors the new ones have to tell if it's uh, back where it's supposed to be other than GPS. Uh, and that can drift sometimes. Just a closer view of it to give you an idea. It's it's not huge, um, probably a foot and a half by foot and a half size. Um, we've had it up in 20 miles an hour winds, and it it works great. It'll it'll fly just fine in about 20 mile an hour. Anything more than that, we don't we don't fly it. So I'll give you a quick rundown. If we're talking about um, data collection, when we're you know not just visible light, quick shot to scout the field, 
Um, but if you do want to collect MDVI data, there's, you know, kind of a, a process to it. Again, I won't spend a ton of time here, but you fly the area of interest. You have to calibrate your sensor. Usually there's either a white balance card or a black body uh, when we talk about thermal. Um, especially have to fly within two hours of solar noon to get the sort of the similar um, incident solar radiation. Your backlight is the sun in this case. Um, and then don't do what my graduate students do and make sure you check the data before you leave the site. Um, if you don't know what the six P's are, look them up. Then we have some software on the back end. We bring all these data collected images back uh, and do some stitching with them in PIX4D. Again, we try to fly low enough to achieve the resolution that we want, but fly enough to have fly high enough to have artifacts in the image. So um, if you're too low, everything's very uniform and it's hard to um, hard to identify where things are in the image. So finally, you know, you do the data collection analysis and then once the data stitched, uh, you identify areas of interest. We use MATLAB. Uh, in the lab, but there's also software packages, including PIX4D, that will do some of that for you. Um, and then we gather values from the area of interest and then do some kind of um, statistical calculation on, on our treatments, et cetera, okay? So now that I've told you sort of what we do with UAVs in our lab and what their capabilities are, I just wanna show you some real world, quote unquote, real world data. Um, that might give you an idea about, about what they're able to do, and especially from the remote sensing standpoint. So, so we're looking at the uh, what we call the alfalfa wheel traffic study. So basically alfalfa is a perennial crop and a lot of machines go into, uh, go into harvesting it. So there's quite a bit of machinery traffic across the field. Question is, does that hurt our yield, et cetera? Um, I won't spend too much time here, but basically, a study in England found that 64% 64, 64 of the field um, was trafficked, had a tire on it at least once. Um, and then if you look at some of the weight weights of the machine in terms of uh, vehicle tons versus applied to the ground, ground pressure, um, you know, we, we all of our ag machines are pretty low, right? We're, we're down at the bottom part of the graph here um, with the agricultural machines. Um, and, you know, in the below 250 would be what I would say. Uh, but a lot of times we're using semi trucks and road trucks um, to to haul the material away from the forage harvester and those ground pressures are much higher so what we did and i'll spend a little time here is we put gps receivers just was enabled you know nothing fancy on every piece of equipment associated in a commercial alfalfa harvest at a operator you know owner operator dairy here east of madison um, and, and I'll just show you a quick map of what we found. So this is um, basically looking at the field entrances. And the purple area is area of the field that did not have tires on it. Everything else was where a machine drove that's kind of been subtracted away. And what I'll ask you to pay attention to when looking at this, this is the you know one, one field entrance here and another field entrance here. And they just try to stay on the end rows, but then they start going down the field. But one operator in a truck took off diagonally across the field just to get back to the chopper in a hurry, that kind of stuff. Um, we flew this field regularly pr prior to and post harvest and got a stitched normalized difference vegetative index image of the field. Um, and there that is for one of the harvests, the harvest I just showed you with the, with the traffic. And again, if you look closely, you can see where the machines have traveled and ruined the end rows, which we expected. But then that one operator came out through the field on a diagonal and you can just see his wheel tracks plain as day. Um, and that is damaged alfalfa that will yield lower um, in those areas. So if you take into account all of the field uh, that was trafficked and some of the damage looks like that, we're starting to see possible yield losses and may need to rethink how we how we harvest alfalfa. So there's my nerdy research uh, conversation with you today. And I think I'm running up against the clock. So I'll summarize what we talked about. Um, you know, several simple tools that we covered right in the beginning can make crop scouting easier. Again, direct from a professional crop scout uh, interviewed, I interviewed for this talk. Look into apps uh, to keep data straight and aid in pest ID. So using your phone is not a bad thing. Um, and that'll allow you to 
to sort of get a get a handle on what's going on. If you have access to UAV or you're interested in learning uh, about how to you'd want, use one, they're, they're new, they're very exciting tools. I think they're very beneficial a lot of times, even if you're just taking the initial picture. Um, but I would make sure the proper licensure is obtained. Visible light image can tell you a lot and using some reflectance sensors um, that are out there may provide more information, but you have to do some data analysis and interpretation with that. Um, finally, and this is coming from a technology guy, in my opinion right now, today, in 2021, all the tech in the world will not make up for being in the field and having a crop scout go out there and look and see what's going on and identify um, problems. So in the future, sensors may get better where we can do that, but currently we're not there. So crop scouts and and uh, interns like you are very much needed for, for those farmers out there trying to, trying to make a living. With that, I'll end my presentation and uh, please feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions. I'll put my email there uh, and also my Twitter handle is Badger Luck. Thank you for your time and attention. Mm -hmm.